Hello, guys. So, um, can you hear me clearly? Okay, nice. So, now let's move on to the topic of quadratic residues. So, just like how... Okay, hang on. Okay, just like how in, in let's say, the, ration, the field of rational numbers, you have you have equations that are not solvable, such as x squared equals two. Right? And so you kind of create a new, a new, a new, a new larger field where you allow the, a number whose square to be two. Right? Let's call it square root two. Well, that's also square root two and minus square root two. And basically as long as we're talking about, as long as square root is concerned, if we define such a thing called a square root, then, well, you're, you, you got, you're basically possible to solve any quadratic equation, right, by the quadratic formula. Uh oh, oh wait 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 why am I the host now? Sorry. Uh hi Jaron. Let me try to Okay, I have no idea how this works. Oh we can just do just go to participant <laughs> participant. Oh right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Then <laughs> there's a allow to record local something. Oh okay, yeah, that okay. Does it work now? I think so. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye. You're welcome. Okay, so let's move on. So basically, yeah, if we if we have a notion of denoting a square root for any number, then we can solve a general quadratic equation, right? Because we have the formula the quadratic formula, which actually is just a consequence of completing the square. So you basically have this plus uh well it's b squared minus four a c over two a wait no over over two a is it something something like that I think let me check. 4a squared, sorry. 4a. So you basically get this, and then you can solve, because you can you know that number can have a square root. Well, if it's larger than or equal to 0. So the same thing applies to FP. So if you're working in the field mod P, what if we have an equation, a quadratic equation? Well, if it's a linear equation, it's easy. If we have a quadratic equation. So when are we sure that it has a solution? And if it does, what is the solution? That's basically the question. So again, we can, well, we can complete the square and do all such things. So the question remains is to see whether a number has or hasn't a square root. So that's the topic for the day. And yeah, so that's quadratic residue. So we define a quadratic residue. We've already defined it in the last lecture already, but I'm going to define it again. We define a quadratic residue to be a number x that is expressible for uh expressible as y squared. Either you work in mod P or you work in Z and you use the congruent symbol. Up to you. Uh well for some Y. Okay. And in the last lecture we saw that there are exactly 
P minus 1 over 2 non-zero quadratic residues, right? They are P minus 1 over 2 non-zero QRs. So, we're going to go one step further and define something called the Legendre symbol. Okay. Yeah. So, Legendre symbol. So, for any integer a, I define this thing which is a very huge abuse of notation, but um, everyone uses this notation, so I, of course I'm going to continue that tradition. So this thing would have three possible values. It's going to be 1, minus 1, or 0. It's 1 if A is a... Maybe not A, let's use X. X is a non-zero QR mod P. And it's minus 1 if X is not a QR mod P. And it's 0 if P divides X. Okay. In fact, um, I shouldn't say non-zero. then P does not divide X. Yeah, that's more like it. So basically, except the trivial case where it's divisible by P, it's either 1 or minus 1, depending on not whether it's a, it's a quadratic residue. Okay, but why such a definition is because, well, it, it, will, it, will, it will be a tool that will be very important to us later. So now let's, study in detail what the Legendre symbol is. So let's go to proposition one. Which is such a number is just congruent to x to the p minus one over two. Oh, by the way, this p for the genre symbol, P must be an odd prime. So I have to write that, sorry. P is an odd prime. It cannot be 2. Well, if it's 2, it's an easy case. 0 and 1 are both quadratic residues. Okay. So proposition 1 is this, not P. So why is that? So there are several ways we can prove this. But first of all, first of all, what does this look like? This look it looks like Fermat's little theorem, but with the exponent divided by half divided by two. So we do know for every x, for every x in or let's say for every p not divisible by x, x to the p minus 1 over 2 is either 1 or minus 1, right? It's either 1 or minus 1. Why? Because this times this is 0 mod p by Fermat Seto theorem. So x to the p minus 1 over 2 is plus or minus 1 mod p. So when is it 1? When is it 1? If x is a qr, that means we can write it as y squared. Then x to the p minus 1 over 2 is just y to the 2 to the p minus 1 over 2, which is just y to the p minus 1. And by Fermat's little theorem, that's 1. So for QRs, it must be plus one. So that so that satisfies the first condition for 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 the number symbol. How about the next one? How can we show that if 
if it's not a QR, it's definitely minus one. So what we can do is to look at the polynomial, look at the polynomial, well, large x, and then p minus one over two minus one equals zero. Well, the polynomial equation, well, I'll just say like that. It has p minus one over two roots. Well, or, or I should say, at most, p minus one over two roots. But there are already p minus one over two non-zero quadratic residues. So we are done. So that means there is no other case where it is one other than the case where it is a QR. So that means if it's not a QR, it must be the other, it must be at the other case, which is minus one. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so this is more of a polynomial proof. So can someone find a primitive root proof? So, well, assume we know that there exists a primitive root mod P, then how do you prove that this value, x to the p minus 1 over 2, is 1 when it's a QR, is minus 1 when it's not a QR? Yeah. Anyone wants to try? Well, I can give you guys a few minutes to, to try and see if you can prove this using primitive roots. So if it's like not a QR, then why is this minus one? Like definitely minus one. But remember, for quadratic residues, what must it be like in terms of primitive roots? It must be g to the power of what kind of number? But non-zero QR. It must be a primitive root raised to the power. Yeah, it raised to a power of even number of an even number, right? So if it's not a QR, <clears throat> if it's not a QR, it must be g to the power of an odd number. <clears throat> Sorry, a bit of cough. Then if it's not a QR, so x is this to the power of p minus 1 over 2. That's g to the power of p minus 1 times k plus p minus 1 over 2. Remember, it's mod p minus 1 on both, so that's g to the p minus 1 over 2, which is minus 1. Well, we've learned that in the last lecture. So that means if it's not a QR, I raise it to the power of p minus 1 over 2, 
you must get minus one as well. Okay. So in fact, this is slightly better than, than brute forcing every single mod p number and see which one are quadratic residues and which one are not, right? So it's basically like asking, okay, is is three, is three um um a quadratic residue mod let's say seventeen. So QR question mark. Then you can just find three to the power of eight and see whether it's plus or minus one mod seventeen. Again, it's a large number, but at least it's a direct method. However, we can do even better because these are large numbers, right? These are very large numbers. We can do even better by using the following theorem, which is a very powerful and very large theorem. The proof is also very complicated. So I'm just going to tell you the theorem first. Okay, the theorem is of three parts. Okay. Um, part the first is that minus one P is minus one to the power of P minus one over two. This one's easy. This one is just literally proposition one, actually. You just put x equals minus one. Part the second is 2p is minus one to the power of p squared minus one over eight. So this part already tells you whether two is a quadratic residue, mod a odd prime, by just looking at minus one to the power of p squared minus one over eight. Part the third is the most important one. Is that P Q Q P is minus one to the power of P minus one over two times Q minus one over two. Where P and Q are odd primes, remember. This is called quadratic reciprocity. Quadratic reciprocity basically if you have let's say <clears throat> 3 101 right we're going to see whether 3 is a qr mod 101 by quadratic reciprocity you can just say this is equals to 101 3 and then minus 1 to the power of p minus 1 over well in this case 3 minus 1 over 2 101 minus 1 over 2 which is well, this thing is 101 over 3. The top bit, you can always take mod p. So that's just 2, 3. And minus 1 to the power of 1 times 50. That's 1. It's 1. This is minus 1 because 2 is not a quadratic mass two. So that's minus 1. So that's the power of quadratic reciprocity. You can flip the numbers provided that they are both odd primes. Okay. Actually, one more, one more fact, just to make this whole theorem complete. A P B P equals A B P. But that one's obvious from proposition one. <clears throat> Okay, uh, you might ask, why is it in a different direction, right? This one is like that. This one is on both sides. Anyone knows why? Why can we say that this, well, why can we say that this is an application of this, even though this one, both uh, Legendre symbols are on the left-hand side, but in this case, one is on the left, one is on the right. Why is it the same meaning? It doesn't matter because they only give one or minus one. Yeah, so the reciprocal of a uh, Legendre symbol is itself. Okay, yep, exactly. So in this lecture, we're going to prove this theorem and all of its parts. In fact, I think this one is redundant if you, if you, if you want to brute force like every single term because what what this theorem says, given any two numbers any number and any odd prime let's say 72 over 101 well use the first bit to always 
split it into chunks of primes and then use the second bit to flip the numbers to create smaller numbers, smaller pairs, and keep doing it until, well, until you get a nice form. And this one is required because the quadratic reciprocity only works for both odd primes. So you have to have a case where the prime is two, and that's also required here. So this theorem basically helps you to solve every, every single case. Like for example, is 72 a QR mod 101? Let's try. Um, 72 is 36 times 2. Okay, I, I gave a very easy example, sorry. Um, this is obviously 1. 6 squared is a quadratic residue. So it's just 2 over 101, so that's minus 1 to the power of 101 squared over minus 1 over 8. Well, in the end, you just want to see whether this is even or odd. And that's just 100 times 102 over 8 divided by 4 divided by 2. So that's odd. Therefore, that's minus 1. So 72 is unfortunately not a quadratic residue mod 101. And you can do this for any any number you want. Just pick any number and then put an odd prime be beneath it. You can calculate whether it's 1 or minus 1. Okay, so any questions about this theorem? Okay. So, the first two we have already proven. We just need to prove the last two. Okay. So again, the two P one is easier. The well, quadratic reciprocity is the hardest part. So let's prove well. To prove both cases, we have to introduce a lemma. Lemma. Okay. I define. Sorry, I should, for for every k mod p, I define the least residue of k mod p to be the number between minus p over 2 and p over 2 which is congruent that is congruent to k it's like normally we say we want to, we want to find the remainder is normally from 1 to p minus, from 0 to p minus 1 uh, but in this case we want to look at the one with the smallest absolute value as in you want the remainder to be from minus p over two to p over two, okay. So it's the it's the it's the it's the same it's the residue with the smallest absolute value. Uh, that's not the lemma. That's just the introduction. The lemma is that x p is minus one to the power of the number of what what number should I use? The number of t such that the number of t between 1 and p minus 1 over 2 such that lr p tx is less than 0. Lemma. In fact, don't look at the proof first. Try it yourself. Try it yourself. See if you can prove this statement because it's it's not a hard it's not a hard lemma.
Because what we want is what we want is x to the p minus one over two. Right? We just have to prove that this thing is equal to that. Okay, I think we can move on to the proof. So the key thing is to look at this set, one, two, three, and so on, until p minus one over two. I multiply by x, so x, two x, three x, dot, 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 p minus one over two. But the product of all of these numbers must be equal to the least residue of all of these numbers. The product of the least residue of all of these numbers. Well, because they are congruent. So nothing, nothing much to say there. But let's see, on the left-hand side, it's going to be x to the p minus 1 over 2, p minus 1 over 2 factorial. But what about the right hand side? So this is congruent. Now, note, note that these numbers, well, they are from one, they are from minus p over two to p over two. But no two numbers here can be of opposite signs. No two numbers here can be of opposite signs. I.e. there is no ix and uh, jx whose sum is zero. There doesn't exist such a number because in that case there will be i plus j is zero but these numbers are from one to p minus one. So that's impossible. i plus j cannot be zero. So that means it must be plus or minus one, plus or minus two. Well, not, not in that order, but plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, dot, 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 until plus or minus p minus one over two. And every single sign is chosen once. So, so like there cannot be plus two and minus two at the same time. So that means it must be minus one to the power of that number, with, with, well, it's this number basically, which I'll call mu. And then p minus 1 over 2 factorial. We cancel the factorials, then we get xp, the genre symbol, equals minus 1 to the mu. Well, this is already in the form of minus 1 or plus, of, or plus 1. So you can change the congruent sign to just an equal sign. So this lemma transforms the problem into just finding the parity of the number of t such that the least residue of tx is less than zero. We just have to find that number. Okay. So this lemma we can apply it to the 2p case, the, what, the 2 over p case. This is minus one to the power of the number of t between p minus one one and p minus one over two such that the least residue of two t is less than zero. So you just have to find this number mu. Let's find mu. So mu is the number of this such that, okay, so now let's transform this into something nice. If the least residue of 2t is less than zero, 
and t is between one and p minus one over two. Well, let's see if we notice what what's two t. Two t must be between two and p minus one, so it's 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 like the regular residues. And it's it's zero. It's less than zero if and only if. Um, two t is more than p plus one over two. Less than or equal to p minus one, right? So I transform this condition into this. So basically, it's on the right half of the set of residues. Two t is there. So let's, well, this is an easy counting problem. <laughs> you just want to find the number of t such that this is true. And you can find it like this. This is p plus 1 over 4 t, and then p minus 1 over 2. But you want p to be an integer, so you have to take the ceiling function here and the floor function here. So mu is literally just p minus 1 over 2 minus the ceiling function of p plus 1 over 4 plus 1. Well, well, how is this somehow equal to p squared minus 1 over 8? Well, we just look at the various cases. The various cases. So let's see. A... P, let me just check the cases here. When P is 8k plus 1, or 8k plus or minus 1, does it work like that? No, um, let's just say 8k plus 1. Then mu is the first term. Well, this is just a routine check 8k plus 2 divided by 4 is 2k plus 1. That's odd. If p is 8k plus 3, that's uh, 4k plus 1 minus 2k plus 1 plus one. Okay, that's also odd. Hang on. Uh, wait, did I write wrongly? Uh, 8k plus... Oh, sorry, this is a ceiling function. This is a ceiling function. This is 2k plus one. This is even, sorry. And you can find the next two cases, which I will skip the steps. Uh, 8k plus five should be even. Uh, 8k plus 5 is odd. And 8k plus 7 is even. So now you just want a, a nice way to, to, to look at these conditions. And apparently one of the candidates is p squared minus 1 over 8. It also satisfies this, with this uh, property. Where it's even when it's ak plus one or ak plus seven, it's odd when it's ak plus three or ak plus five. Therefore, you can say that two over p is minus one to the p squared minus one over eight. Okay. So that's the first part of the theorem. The two case. Okay, let's uh, find the space there. So let's now prove quadratic reciprocity. Let's now prove quadratic reciprocity. Well, we're going to use that lemma again. So this is equal to minus 1 to the mu1 plus mu2. In fact, I should write it as mu p and mu q, just to make it absolutely clear. 
uh, like I want to double check what notation I use. Okay, so mu p, I define it to be the number <clears throat> of one t p minus one over two such that uh the the left the, the least residue of q t is less than zero and mu q is the number of one of t between one and q minus one over two such that the least residue mod q of p t is less than zero. So you swap you swap the, the two rows of p and q. And you have this. So now we have to study what mu p plus mu q is. We have to study this thing. Okay. Let's just study mu p first. Because they're the same. So once we study mu p, we can study mu q immediately. So I'm going to copy this. Oops. I'll change this to an x first. Okay. So now, if the left, if the least residue of QX is less than zero, that means for every. So if it if 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 this is true, we say that we say that X is nice. Okay. If it's not true, then we say X is bad. All right. So for every nice X. For every nice X. For every nice x, there exists a y such that qx minus py is less than zero, right? Less than zero more than minus p over two. That's the definition of nice because you know qx there is some number where if you scale it to that interval between minus p over two and p over two, you will be less than zero. In fact, I will write it in a more strict way. So I write this between minus one and whatever this is p minus one over two. Then it well then the bounds are tighter and we get and we get better bounds. Okay. Let's look at let's look at what y must satisfy, right? Let's look at what y must satisfy. So py must be less than okay, you just rearrange the equation. Just rearrange the equation. You should get um I'll just rearrange it for you here. So PY, this is 1 plus QX, and this is, uh, hang on, P minus 1 over 2 plus QX, I'm not wrong. So Y is, between these two numbers, between these two numbers. Okay, but x is between one and p minus one over two. So, okay, that's more than zero. We don't care what that is. That's less than, what's that less than, uh, p, 
minus 1 over 2 plus q p minus 1 over 2 over p. Okay, that's less than q plus 1 over 2. Because that's less than when I change it into p and so on. So, well, all of this tells us that y is between 1 and q minus 1 over 2. Well, because this is, this is an integer, of course, but the smallest integer, the largest integer less than that is q minus 1 over 2. Okay, you might ask what's the purpose of finding this property of y, because we kind of... It's a very loose condition, right? Because we consider x to be between 1 and p minus 1 over 2, and we just use literally that bound. Um, but what I'm going to do is this. So this number will be in bijection, in a bijection, with the lattice points. I'll try write this. So if I draw, if I draw a graph, right, then this is one, this is two, this is three, and so on. This is one, this is two, this is three. Until p minus one over two, then here is until q minus one over two. Well, we look at this rectangle. Look at this rectangle. It's a very ugly rectangle. You look at this rectangle. And for every x, I just plot the corresponding y. For every x, I just plot the corresponding y. So maybe it's here, maybe it's here, maybe the next one is here, maybe this one is here, so on and so forth. It's the exact same number because for every x, I just plot the y coordinate, which is unique. Okay. But why do I do that? It's because this nice property. X is between 1 and P minus 1 over 2. Y is between 1 and Q minus 1 over 2. So if we flip the rows of P and Q, you can regard it as to be in the same rectangle, just rotated, right? So we can say that this is in bijection, but this is the geometric way of writing the number of lattice points in 1 to p minus 1. Hopefully, hopefully I, I taught this before, which is the, pro the Cartesian product between two sets. It's just the set of pairs where the first entry is in the first set, the second entry is in the second set. So it's just this thing. Where, uh, hang on. where, there we go. So Qx minus Py is been in between these two numbers. It's in between these two numbers. Okay, so that's mu, mu p. Now I'm going to write mu q. How do I write mu q? I just swap p and q everywhere in this expression, right? I just swap p and q. So this is like that. Like that. Like this. Px minus qy less than or equal to minus one. Well, but that's not nice, right? We want to put them in the same rectangle. So let's just swap x and y. Let's just swap x and y. Well, I'll still write x y here. I'll just swap the two the two intervals here. So this will become like that. And this 
touch that. Uh, minus Q minus one over two. Less than or equal to PY minus QX. Less than or equal to minus one. Okay. So notice what's happening here. If we merge these two sets together, look at the condition here and here. This is QX minus PY. This is PY minus QX. It's just the negative version of the other, the other one. And I just flip, flip the numbers. This becomes between plus 1 and plus Q minus 1 over 2. So we know that mu P plus mu Q is the set the size of the set of all lattice points in this rectangle. In this rectangle. Such that, well, it cannot be zero anyway, otherwise x and, x and y cannot be between 1 and p minus 1 over 2 and q minus 1 over 2. So this will be qx minus py less than or equal to q minus 1 over 2. So I just merge these two conditions together. Okay, any questions so far? We just created a bijection between mu p and mu p plus mu q and the number of lattice points in this region satisfying this property. Okay, but why did we do that? Because in the end, we want to count the parity of mu p plus mu q, right? We want to see whether it's even or whether it's odd. And if you draw it in a very geometrical way, maybe we can pair we can pair them up, right? If we have a rectangle, maybe we can pair it symmetrically. Maybe if if one point works, then the reflection of that point over the center of the rectangle also works. Maybe that's true. And in, in fact, that's true. Later, you will see. <laughs> and then you can find the parity quite easily and whether, whether it's an odd number or an even number. So... So now we just have to find the parity of this set, but well, the size of this set. So my claim is that, so this is rectangle, right? What's the center of the rectangle? The center of the rectangle is, well, p minus one over two plus one, that's p plus one over two divided by two. That's p plus one over two, q plus one over two. Oh, sorry, uh, the four, sorry, four. Four. Add the mom divided by two, midpoint. This center may or may not be a lattice point, doesn't matter, because sometimes p plus one is not a multiple of four, but again, doesn't matter. My claim is that the points in this set is symmetric about this center. In fact, that's a very algebraic exercise it's a very algebraic exercise. So basically, if x and y works, you substitute the reflection of x and y over this center, plug it back in, it also works. That's, that's basically what I'm saying. Um, I'm not sure if I if I have the will to, 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 to do that out on this whiteboard because it's very laggy. But any, okay, fine. I'll just, I'll just roughly sketch what you're supposed to do. So basically, the claim is that if x, y works, then the reflection of that point over the center also also works. So how, how, how do you do that? Um, how do you find the reflection of x, y over another point? Anyone has an idea? The reflection of x, y over whatever that is, p plus 1 over 4, q plus 1 over 4. Yeah, I use the midpoint for midpoint formula, but but kind of like the other way around, right? So, like you want you want u, the vector u plus the vector uh, well the coordinate u plus the coordinate v, over two to be the midpoint. To be the center. 
So the reflection should be two times the center minus u, right? So you want to prove that p plus two, p plus one over two, minus x and p and q plus one over two minus y also works. It's a very routine exercise. You just assume that inequality is true, substitute that thing in, rearrange it, you should get get back the same inequality if I'm not wrong. Yeah. So I'll, I'll skip this claim. It's a very algebraic, it's a very technical step. So I'll skip that. I'll just assume it works. Okay, so it works. Now, so how, so then how many points are in this set? How many points are in this set? When is it even? When is it odd? What's the particular case when it's even? What's the particular case when it's odd? Since this, well, assuming this claim is true. When is it odd? Like we, we kind of establish this pairing, right? We pair every point with another point. So by right, there should be an even number of numbers. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So the, 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 the troublesome thing is this center, right? Because if the center is in the, in the, in the point, sorry, if the center works, the reflection of the center is itself. That's what we call a fixed point in in uh in mathematics. So we kind of do some pairing. But there are some pairs where its partner is itself. This would cause the parity to be odd, right? Because every other point is paired is paired up already. And in fact, if p plus one over four, q plus one over four are integers, basically if it's a lattice point, it obviously works. You can plug that in and see. You can it, it obviously works. You plug that in. It's a very loose inequality. Just plug that in, you will see that it's between these two numbers. Therefore, mu p plus mu q is odd or even. It's odd when 4 divides both p plus q uh, p plus 1 and q plus 1. And it's even otherwise. It's even otherwise. Okay, we're basically done, right? We're basically done. What other number satisfies this? Because we, we, we don't like such a case. We don't like to write these kind of cases when we're going to write a nice formula. Apparently, this number works. p minus 1 over 2, q minus 1 over 2. This number, sorry, times, not, not comma, times. This number is odd if and only if P is 4K plus 2 and, sorry, P is 4K plus 3 and Q is also 4K plus 3. So this number works. Otherwise, it's always even. And therefore, we are done. <laughs> That's the proof of this theorem. So we finally proved quadratic reciprocity. And it's a very nice proof, I think. I mean, this is, this is one of the proofs. It's not the only proof, but it kind of brings out the feeling of, 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 of like how you, how you deal with bijections. And here, it's a very beautiful approach using bijections where even though here you're counting the number of x's, you kind of introduce this new variable called y so that you can make it into a 2D picture and try to pair points up. Okay, if that makes sense. And in the end, you see that there's a nice symmetry to it. So that, that's that's normally what happens when 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 you want to count just the parity of an of, of a of a set instead of the actual size of the set.
when you're talking about parity, probably there is some pairing matching going on in the problem. Okay, so we've we've proven that theorem. And that's basically the, the, the climax of this of this lecture. So well I'll, I'll give you guys a few minutes to digest all of this because we still have one hour left. So we can practice the exercises. So I'll give you guys five minutes break. And then after five minutes I will return back. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm back and let's just now look to the exercise problems. So the first one, the Hong Kong one, let's try that one. So we have let P be a prime which is 4k plus 1. <clears throat> Hang on, the, the whiteboard is loading. So P, which is 1 mod 4, is prime. So find this thing. where this curly bracket is the, what do you call it again? The decimal function. Well, it's basically the number itself minus the floor function. The decimal part probably is called, the fractional part, the fractional part. Yeah, so this thing. So I'll give you guys um how long 10 minutes to try so we will discuss at 12 16 yeah okay have fun okay so anyone has any idea anyone sum of squares well does it work so how would you do sum of squares sum of square is k k minus k plus one to k plus one over six mm -hmm. yeah but then okay but this is the that's the, the fractional part Right, so okay, so you can write this as probably like that. Hang on, it's lagging. <laughs> Minus one k squared. But how would you handle the floor part? So this one's okay, this one's fairly easy to find. Uh how about this part? So that one's a little bit difficult, probably, because it can range from, well, maybe it's possible, but then it will be quite bashy. It seems like we need to count, so use Gauss lemma. Which, which Gauss lemma are you talking about? Gauss's lemma is... Ah, okay, okay, that one, yeah. Hmm. Well, okay, it's okay. Uh, this is this is a much simpler way. Probably those those methods can work in some sense. But um, first of all, you have to use this condition. Okay, one 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 might one might be tempted to do the Gaussian pairing, kind of thing. 
like k squared over p and then consider p minus k squared over p. But um, that won't work, I think, because this will give you p squared minus 2pk plus k squared over p, which its fractional part is just the same thing as k squared over p. So that won't give you anything. Okay, so it's 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 about pairing, but not the first one with the last one, it's the second one with the third one, or something like that. Um it's if you want to use if you want me to say it explicitly, I cannot be able to say it explicitly. It's it's something that is implicit. Hang on, why is my stylus pen not working again? Uh give me a moment. So the thing about squares quadratic residues when p is 4k plus 1 is that if x is a quadratic residue minus x is also a quadratic residue hang on okay there we go it works So remember that this thing is actually is actually one, right? So B P is equals to minus one B P is equal to minus one minus B P. That means if B is a quadratic residue, then minus B is also a quadratic residue. Okay. And therefore, therefore, okay, first of all, we can simplify this, simplify this because we know it's symmetric. So it's just twice of this thing over 2, and then k squared over p. But we know that if B, okay, I can write this in a nicer way. Because we know that if K is 1 to P minus 1 over 2, then K squared is all of the QRs, right? So we can say this is all QRs. So K is a QR. K over P. Or I should say B is a QR. B over P. But we know that B is a QR if minus B is a QR. So this is just B QR. And then plus minus B. Okay, but what's this? What's this? What is the fractional value of x plus the fractional part of minus x? The fractional part of minus x. It's always 0 or 1, right? 0 or 1. 0 if x is an integer. 1 otherwise. So, but these, these are never 0, right? These are never 0. These are never 0. So, this is just 1. Well, I should say B is non-zero as well, but uh, you probably can get that. So this is just P minus 1 over 2. Yeah, P minus 1 over 2. Okay.
So it's about pairing, but a little bit different from pairing. Okay. So let's try the next one. Let's try the next one. So m is a positive integer. If 2 to the m plus 1 plus 1 divides 3 to the 2m plus 1, then 2 to the m plus 1 plus 1 is prime. Okay, so again, this one, give you guys a few minutes to try. This one I will probably give uh, six minutes. So we'll discuss at 12.30. Okay, good luck. Okay, so anyone has any idea? I'll just let Q be 2 to the n plus 1 plus 1. Or is it P? Okay. Then that means 3 to the 2 to the m equals minus 1 mod P. Right. Well, if you see this, you should be happy because this tells you a lot of things such as if you square both sides, you get this thing, right? Then what can you say about the order of three mod p? What's the order of three mod p? The order of three mod p. Actually, hang on. I I should I shouldn't write p because you might think it's prime. So let's put q. Let's just put q. So remember our last lecture about orders. What should the order? Well, the order of three should divide two to the n plus one, right? But can it be anything less than two to the n plus one? Any factor of this is a mod is a power of two. Can it be any power of two less than two to the n plus one? If three to the two to the k equals one for some k less than n plus one, then this cannot hold anymore. Yeah, it cannot. Yeah, exactly. This cannot hold anymore. Therefore, the order of three or q is exactly equal to 2 to the n plus 1. Uh, plus, uh, plus 1, yeah. Which is actually just q minus 1. Right? So how do you conclude that it's prime? How do you conclude that q is prime? The order must divide phi of q, right? The order must divide phi of q because that's the size of the size of z over q z uh multiplicative group. Okay. But phi of q is less than q, obviously, by the definition of phi of q. So phi of q is q minus 1. That means q must be prime. Those are the only candidates that, that whose, whose phi function is q minus 1. Okay. Okay, now the converse. We, we didn't use anything about qr's here. So let's do the converse. 
So if Q, which is 2 to the n plus 1 plus 1, is prime, I want to prove the previous result. So 3 to the 2m plus 1 is a multiple of p. Then 3 to the 2 to the m is actually equal to 3 to the q minus 1 over 2. Right? q minus 1 over 2. So since q is prime, we know that this is either 1 or minus 1. So what it remains to be proven is that this is minus 1, it's not plus 1. So how do we prove that? How to prove 3 to the q minus 1 over 2 is minus 1? But what's this? What's this number? Hmm. Like mod q. This is just the Legendre symbol 3 over q, right? Remember proposition 1? So let's do over q. So both are primes, quadratic reciprocity. Okay, so this is 2 to the m plus 1 plus 1 over 3. <laughs> and then minus 1 to the 1 times 2 to the m. Okay, so that's, m is a positive integer, so that's 1. But this guy here. This is either zero. This is because because well, this thing is mod three is minus one to the m plus one plus one, which is either one or zero, right? Mod mod three cannot be zero. Otherwise, q is three, and m will be zero. So this must be one. Hey, wait, hang on. Uh, there it is. <laughs> there do something wrongly here. Give me a moment. Wait, no, this is 0 or 2, sorry. Oh, what am I saying? This is, so this is 2 over 3. It's minus 1. So yeah, so we're, we're done here. Okay, let's try the next one. So find all zero a between zero and two oh seven integers such 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 that x squared plus a equal to zero but congruent to zero not two oh seven. Seven has exactly two distinct roots less than okay. Uh, I should write between zero and two oh seven. Okay, these are integers by the way all of them are integers oh 
Okay. And this one, I'll give a little bit more time. I'll give 10 minutes again. And we'll discuss at 12.49. So by the way, I can give you a hint, which is 207. Prime, it's prime factorization. It's three squared times two, two, three. That's the prime factorization of 207. Okay, have fun. All right. So anyone has any plan or, or anyone solved it already? or any sketch of plan on how you would approach this problem. Um uh, oh, oh. two oh seven minus one, two oh seven minus two minus four. Okay. Well. Okay, two A is two zero zero seven. Mm -mm. Minus one minus four minus well two. This might work, but how do how would you count the number of it can be quite confusing, right? Because okay, until what number? And how because there might be some repeated values again. And on top of the repeated values, you can have numbers where this one has three distinct roots. Or even one distinct root. And or even well. Yeah, so like sometimes you have two zero zero seven minus zero. Mm -mm. And then until what number? So that's like the question. And another person said decomposing the odd prime using CRT. CRT, yeah, C because 207 is a is a composite number, and if it's a composite number, you can screw up a lot of things. For example, if it's a composite number, you can have many roots. A quadratic equation can have many roots when you are working under a mod 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 uh composite number. For example, x squared equals zero. Mod eight. It's not just two. It's not. It's not just two solutions. You can have zero, two, four, six. Hang on. Uh no. Um, two zero four. Oh wait, okay, that, that okay, forget that. But there are there are equations where there are more than two solutions. Uh can't think of one yet, but yeah. So well, so yeah, something like that, but we have we have to first decompose it first to, to make our lives easier and to reduce the risk of making errors. So x squared plus a is zero mod nine. mod 9 and x squared plus a is 0 mod 2, 2, 3. Okay. Well, we haven't talked about quadratic residues mod a prime power, but this one is a very, a very small number. We can just manually check which numbers have two solutions. Okay. So when a is well we can first first of all one squared zero squared is zero one squared is one two squared is four three squared is zero four squared is uh seven five squared and so on is just a reflection of one zero one four zero seven so we know if a if a is Eight, five, and two. There are two solutions for x. If it's zero, there's three solutions for x. Zero, three, and 
six, right? Yeah, zero, three, and six. Zero, three, and six. For all of the other ones, one, three, four, six, seven. There will be no solutions. Right. Okay. So this is the well the 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 table for how many values of x. And how about x squared plus a is zero mod two two three? Well, you know, 2 to 3 is prime, so that's nice. And there would be... There would be quite a few values where... Okay, so if A is 0, it's this, if A is 0, there's only one solution, which is 0. If A is one of the non-zero QRs, which there are one, one, one of them, and there are one, one, one QRs, uh, non-QRs, then there will be zero X and this will be two X. Okay, you want an A, you want an A, Sorry, this should even be more precise. This is A mod 9. This is A mod 2, 2, 3. You want an A where you want you where you have two X's. So how can that be? Well. So it cannot be this one. Definitely cannot be this one. Cannot that def definitely cannot be this one. And Cannot be this one as well. Right. We want two distinct roots. So if A is a multiple of two, two, three, then there will be only one X. Uh wait, no. Wait, no, sorry. Okay, uh, I made a mistake here. So this is how many x, again, this is how many x in mod 9. <laughs> so yeah, we, we cannot do that yet. This is how many x mod 223. So it's a bit more complicated than that. Okay. I need to write the table below, probably. Yeah. Okay. So, so. If there are, if A is one of these, there are many X's, it is still zero. But how many X mod 2007? Then there will be 3 times 223. 2 times 223. Two, two, how many X mod 2007? There will be 9 of them, 18 of them. And zero of them here. Okay. <clears throat> hmm. Well, we want the intersection of those two numbers. Ah, hang on. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. No, sorry, 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 sorry. Because we did CRT. 
So whatever whatever X mod nine is, whatever X mod two two three is, there is an X mod two o o seven for that. So we don't have to look at that. Sorry. But but. You have to make sure that two. Okay, so however many x there is here, a, sorry, a. Uh, let's say there are p axes here. There are q axes here. Then there would be p times q roots, right, for x, because if there are p possible x values mod nine, there are q possible values mod two to three. Every single pair would work CRT to generate a, a new root. So we want P times Q to be two because we want two exactly distinct roots, right? So what are the two possible values that multiply the two here? It is two times one, right? Two times one. Two times one. So okay, let's look let's look at this condition first. So A is a multiple of two to three. Two, two, three, B. Okay, then we just solve for B. We just want two, two, three, B to be two, five, or eight mod nine. And let's solve for B. That's uh two two three mod nine is seven B. So B is okay, let's divide by two, divide by two, divide by four, minus one plus two and minus four. So that would be eight, two and five mod nine. So A would have three possible values, two, two, three times two. Just four four six. Two two three times five, which is one 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 five. And A is two two three times eight, which is one seven uh eight four, is it? Let me check. Yeah. So these are the three A's. There are only three possible A's. Okay, so it's one o'clock now. Any other questions? So if no questions, then I guess we can end the class here. Good luck for your test. Whenever that is, I'm not sure. Next week. Oh, oh, next week. Okay, then it's plenty of time. Nice. Okay, so if no questions, then we'll end the class here. So thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, Richard.